Well, good morning. It's a delight to be with you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this important conference and to share a few perspectives about policies and politics from the view of uh, one policy, former policy leader in the United States. Mr. Secretary General Tono, thank you for your leadership, for your vision, for your passion, for positive change. Uh, the work that you've done on behalf of the EPP and the center is appreciated, it's important, it's meaningful, and your leadership sets the tone, not just for this gathering, but much more broadly. And I appreciate your hospitality and your graciousness and the invitation to be here this morning. Let's give the Secretary General a round of applause for his leadership. One of the uh, famous people from my home state is Thomas Friedman. He's currently a columnist for the New York Times. Some years ago, he wrote the book, The World is Flat. Some of you may remember the book. It was an important piece of work. But in oversimplified terms, the premise of the book was that given the deployment of technology and data storage uh, around the world in an increasingly equal way, that many functions, many perspectives around the world will be equalized, will be flat in his view in the not too distant future. That people all around the world will have easy and simultaneous access to the same tools and information and data and perspective. It will be distributed in real time across the globe and that things will be flat in terms of perspective. Well, it's a very interesting book. Uh, but another perspective that was in response to that book was brought forward by the very famous uh, management and leadership uh, guru, Peter Drucker, who died not too many years ago in California. Before he died, uh, someone wrote the book called The Ultimate Drucker. And the woman who wrote the book had a chance to spend some time with Peter Drucker in the last few years of his life. And she asked him, he had lived long enough to hear about the book, The World is Flat, and the premise, The World is Flat. And this woman, who was the author of the book, approached Drucker and said, what do you think about the premise, The World is Flat? And Peter Drucker thought for a moment, there was a moment of, of pause, and, and he responded by saying, not for very long. <laughs> not for very long. And what he meant by that, and uh, I'm paraphrasing this part, was, in a world where individuals and enterprises and parties and countries and entities constantly strive to gain some advantage or to uh, move ahead, the notion that things will be flat or frozen is a flawed premise. Now, regardless of whether you, where you fall on that continuum, each party, each country, each politician, each business steps back and says, well, what is that thing that makes our uh, party, our country, our business unique or special or gives it so-called comparative advantage. And I asked that question and shared this perspective with you this morning because I think it's one of the things, the answer to that question is what brings this together this morning, brings us together this morning philosophically and otherwise, and it's this. When at least I think about the future of the United States and we say, well, what are those things that may continue to make the United States a great country? Is it because we have the biggest demography? Is it because we have the most people? Uh, no, that's not true. We only have a little over 300 million people and compared to some of the places we're competing against, our population is one fourth or one fifth or one third the size. So we're not going to continue to be a great place just because of we're the biggest. Well, is it that we then are the cheapest place? Are we going to, from a United States perspective or an EU perspective, are we going to be, continue to be a great place because we're the cheapest? Well, clearly that's not true. Uh, we have seen places around the world. We need to be more competitive. And perhaps uh, you can think of some places in Europe that need to be more competitive as well. Uh, but if we're, we're not the cheapest place in the world, so if we're not the biggest demographically, and we're not the cheapest economically, then what is the comparative advantage for my country or your country or for the EU? Well, one of the things that gives us comparative advantage is we're free. And sometimes people hear the word freedom and they say, well, that's just a word. It's just a throwaway line from some politician, some candidate for office. Well, it's a very important word, and it's not just a word, but it is a philosophy, and it is a, something that is, in my view, one of the most important things we can think about going forward, and given our 
common relationship, common philosophy, common perspective, and common values. And we shouldn't take it for granted. And we should remind each other and those that we strive to serve of the importance of that perspective. When people are free, uh, we have the freedom to worship as we see fit or not. We have the freedom to dream or to innovate or to invent as we see fit or not. We have the freedom to express ourselves uh, or not as we see fit. We have the freedom to associate or not as we see fit. We have the freedom to uh, undertake a vision or a dream individually or collectively without limit. And of course, uh, those of us in this room or some of us may say, well, of course that's the way it is. But as you know, that's not the way it is in many places around the world, and it's not the way it is throughout history. So when we ask ourselves, well, what are those things that separate the United States or Europe or other places from the rest of the world, give it comparative advantage, and perhaps can, perhaps can continue to be a beacon of hope for the rest of the world, it stems from this root philosophy, this root perspective that we are free. And when people are free, it unleashes in them a creativity and an inventiveness and innovativeness, a freedom uh, of, of speech and perspective that is different, fundamentally different, than many places and cultures across the globe and throughout history. It is not to be taken for granted. It needs to, we need to remind each other of that seminal importance, and we need to make sure that that gets lifted up in the debate. It's also, by the way, what will make Europe and what will make the United States continue to be great places. Because when you have the freedom to innovate and invent and do the next thing potentially faster, quicker, better uh, than somebody else, that's going to give you comparative advantage. I share that with you for this reason. We're having a great debate across the globe about a transition, for example, in the wake of the Arab Spring. Uh, we see in that region, uh, in many places, many decades of autocrats, tyrants, dictators, people who led countries with an oppressive hand, attempted to suffocate out and stifle freedom, used a tyranny and violence and oppression as a way to suppress freedom. And then you see the collateral damage of that in terms of the suppression of the human spirit, the suppression of freedom, the suppression of, of free markets, what that means to in innovativeness, inventiveness, creativity, uh, opportunity, education, empowerment of people. And what you see then, of course, are economies and cultures and societies that do not live up to their full potential or anything close to it. And so now in the world, of, the world is flat as people have access to information and opportunity, they're taking control of their own destiny, their own future. I had a chance just a few weeks ago to be one of the leaders of the IRIs and other groups' uh, efforts to monitor the elections in Tunisia. And of course, it's the place where the Arab Spring started. And their elections, at least procedurally, uh, went pretty smoothly. I mean, they were well-conducted elections procedurally. And we can have various uh, comments or thoughts about the outcome and the future of Tunisia. I hope it is all very positive. But the thing that is most positive about the, the, that turn of events in Tunisia, they moved from decades worth of oppression and heavy-handed tyranny under a leader, Ben Ali, moving now to a government that will reflect the values and perspectives of a democratically elected, or a democratic society uh, in Tunisia. And we see that hopefully unfolding in Libya, although that is a work in progress, as my table mate and I briefly discussed before I came up here, uh, and throughout the rest of the world. But for the United States, or at least for me personally, and I know for most in this room, when we see uh, the unfolding of an opportunity, whether it be in Libya, whether it be in Tunisia, whether it be in Syria, or in other places, where we have an opportunity to move from tyranny, oppression, suppression, and violence uh, to something that is free and open and democratic, uh, we can all and should all embrace that opportunity. I was uh, one of the first, if not the first, American politician at the time I was running for president to say we should establish the no-fly zone and help with respect to the early events in Libya. Uh, I was one of the first to say that Bashir al-Assad is a killer of his own people. He's a tyrant and he needs to go. Uh, we have other opportunities with, with respect to Egypt. I was one of the first to say it is time to uh, move beyond Mubarak and move to a better future for Egypt. 
Now, obviously, these circumstances and events are complicated. There's a lot of work that needs to be done beyond just making those kinds of declarative statements. But it reflects, uh, I think, a, a commitment uh, for people in this room, people in the United States, those who appreciate and love democracy around the world, to do all they can to support those movements. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful about what that reflects, not just for that region, but for the world going forward and, and for our values, our shared values. Number two, in terms of the relationship between the United States and Europe, uh, is vitally important. And of course, uh, we have this long history, long tradition, shared values, love of freedom, and openness, democracy, uh, and the like. And I'm hopeful about the future, but it comes at a point in time where we're discussing uh, a lot of great challenges for the EU and for the United States, too. And without getting into the details of all of that, it is, in my view, it becomes mathematical. These are largely, at the moment, focused on financial issues, spending issues. And uh, when you have enterprises, whether they be businesses or countries, that spend more than they take in, uh, in terms of revenues over a long period of time, it becomes not a matter of the, a debate between the right and the left, it becomes a matter of intermediate school mathematics. Uh, you cannot have uh, systems that continue to spend more than they take in over a long period of time. It's not a great political debate, it's a matter of, of uh, basic math. And now those mathematical challenges are coming home to roost, as we say, and need to be reconciled. And the changes implied by that are not easy. They're not just a math exercises. They affect people. They affect lots of legacy institutions. They affect lots of programs. They affect lots of politics. But it needs to be done. And so I'm hopeful, as I know you are in this room, for improvement. We hope for it in the United States. I know you're hopeful on the eve of uh, these important discussions today and tomorrow in the EU as well. But I want to just close and then throw the rest of the time open for questions with some reflections about the upcoming election in the United States. And so you know, of course, we have a presidential election coming up next year. Uh, people look at the polls nationally in the United States and then, and then they make some judgments about what the, the polls say a year from now, about how the election will go a year from now. Well, you know from watching American politics that a year is a very long time in American politics, and what looks certain today may not be certain a year from now. So my comments are based on the snapshot of time of what we know today with that qualifier. If you look at the polls in the United States, you'll see the following facts. President Obama's approval rating and re-election numbers are modest, to say the least. They hover in the 40 percentile, uh, so job approval and re-elect number against a so-called generic Republican. So many experts look at those numbers and say President Obama's numbers are pretty weak uh, in terms of his political position. But keep in mind a couple of things. One is he's going to raise a lot of money and spend a lot of money against whoever the Republican candidate is who's identified in the coming months. And that um, campaign is going to have an effect back and forth between the candidates. And keep something else in mind. If you put in generic Republican or one of the leading Republican candidates against President Obama, depending on the poll or the day or the week, it's about tied. So for example, the candidate I support in that race, Mitt Romney versus Barack Obama, it's about tied nationally. And then you look at that and say it's going to be a very close election. But as you know, it's not a national election in a technical sense, it's an electoral college election. So you have to compile the requisite number of electoral votes state by state. And if you break down the states that will ultimately decide the election, it comes down to just six or eight states within the United States. So the election nationally is about time, about time, but if you break it down to Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, New Hampshire, Ohio, Wisconsin, Iowa, Colorado, and maybe New Mexico, those are states that John McCain lost that are now trending back Republican a bit. You look at those states and say, how would the hypothetical matchup be between President Obama and a Republican candidate, say Mitt Romney, in those states, uh, it looks much more favorable at the moment for Republicans. So for example, if you went to Florida, a very important and large state in the electoral process, and looked at independent voters, not the people who are automatically either uh, or reliably Republican or Democrat, and just said, how do you feel about the presidential race? you would see that the independent voters in Florida are trending towards the idea of not re-electing President Obama 
and probably electing, uh, a, a, you know, if it's Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney. And that pattern repeats itself in most of those other states. The independent voters in Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, New Hampshire, Ohio, Wisconsin, Iowa, Colorado, and New Mexico, and there'll be some other states as well, are moving towards uh, the Republicans at this moment in time. So it's a long election, much can happen between now and then, but that's a quick snapshot of it. So it's, it will perhaps be a close election, it could be a tidal wave election, but as you look at the numbers, as you look at the polls and want to guess or try to predict what will happen, those national numbers are less important than those state-by-state -state numbers, particularly amongst independent voters. So if you break down those independent voters in those states, like I said, in a, on rough terms, about 35% of the people are likely to vote Republican, quite, quite likely, and then about 35% are, give or take, are likely to vote Democrat. It leaves this last 30% who are independents. If you look at who those independents are, they tend to be, not entirely, but disproportionately in a place like Wisconsin or Ohio, New Hampshire, uh, many suburban women voters. There's also some uh, other types of voters who fall into that category. For example, middle-aged uh, male voters who perhaps have faced some economic challenge. And there's a lot of uh, unrest and a lot of uncertainty and concern about the current direction and current policies in the United States. And those voters are in the mood for additional change, more change, probably away from President Obama. The, the, and then just very lastly, the top issue in the race is the economy, the jobs in the economy. There's no other issue in the debate at the moment that even comes close to the importance of the issue in the campaign besides the jobs in the economy. Uh, of course, President Obama will make his case for why his plan uh, you know, will work or could work better in the future. The Republicans will make their, their case, but it's going to focus largely on uh, the rise and fall of the unemployment rate, the rise and fall of whether jobs are growing or not, as it does in Europe. If the economy uh, somehow miraculously improved in the United States, obviously President Obama's chances would increase. I don't think that will happen rapidly enough to fundamentally change what I just said about his chances. More likely the economy in the United States, if it improves, will improve modestly, or perhaps not at all. And if that remains the case, there's going to be a great appetite, I think, for some additional change politically uh, in the United States. So I'd love to hear what's on your mind by way of questions about either uh, the relationship between the European countries and the United States or American politics or the like, but we appreciate this exchange. Uh, the uh, IRI, the International Republican Institute, does great democracy building work all around the world and as that work gets done in places like Tunisia, we see tremendous partnerships and friendships and help from our European friends and partners. And we enjoy and appreciate that partnership and want to thank you again for the hospitality and the invitation for being here this morning. Thank you for listening on behalf of the